The Martian Conspiracy, written by John Reed, narrated by Chris A. Bell. Prologue. July 2068, Moffett Field, San Francisco Bay Area. It took me five years to rebuild the vintage katana. I sat in a time-worn leather seat and threw the red master switch. The cockpit came alive with the hum of whirling gyroscopes as the instruments came online. A key rested in the ignition and I turned it clockwise two clicks. The engine coughed several times, sputtered and rumbled to a steady idle. Air washed into the cockpit, carrying with it the smell of hot tarmac and engine oil. I reached up and closed the canopy, put on a classic green DC headset, and fixed the microphone to my chin. I taxied to Moffat's runway, got clearance from ATC and took to the sky. The airstrip disappeared below me, replaced by the murky shoreline slough. The Rotax 912 engine tugged at the air, pulling the katana higher into the California sky. I flew over San Jose's rusted desalination plants and continued north toward San Francisco. On my right, windmills on the East Bay skyline carved the atmosphere with 300-foot blades. Sailboats with colorful spinnakers littered the bay, but the skies over San Francisco were empty. It was just me and the seagulls this morning. I flew over Bernal Heights, where my wife and I were about to move. Marie had dreamed of renting one of the Victorian flats that peppered San Francisco's historic neighborhoods. We had made that dream a reality, signing the lease the previous Friday. Passing the Golden Gate Bridge, I banked right, heading toward wine country. I checked my watch. Forty minutes until I have to land. The southern tip of Napa Valley had airspace dedicated to aerobatics. Would the controllers let me use it? The katana was agile but by no means a stunt plane. I decided to give it a try. Sonoma Tower, this is Katana 279er Foxtrot, requesting permission to enter practice area Charlie. Over. Copy, Katana 279er. Charlie is empty. You are clear for aerobatic flight up to 6,000 feet. Roger that, Tower. 6,000 feet. Katana 279er out. I grinned. With the throttle punched in, I cranked the stick to the left, rolling into a steep left bank that pressed the airframe to its structural limits. Adrenaline pulsed through me. Or was that just the G-load? It was probably both. I dove, gaining speed as altitude dwindled. A hundred feet from the swamps of Skaggs Island, I pulled up, shooting back into the sky. As the aircraft bled off speed, I kicked the rudder to the right, throwing the katana into a hammerhead. I'd never be able to do this again. Better make it count. I exited the hammerhead into another dive, and then leveled out, thinking of Marie. On that note, I kept my distance from the ground. Marie would kill me if I died, I thought. After a few more wingovers and attempted loops, most of which ended in stalls, I'd had all my stomach could take. I radioed Sonoma Sky Park and requested permission to land. After a single circuit around the airport, I set the aircraft down and taxied toward the hangars. A man in his mid-fifties waited on the tarmac and waved as I taxied by. He was getting a fully rebuilt katana, a plane he'd surely enjoy for years to come. The katana came to a stop. I pulled back on the mixture control, switched off the master, and pulled out the key. I unclipped the four-point harness and flipped up the canopy, tossing my headset onto the co-pilot seat. We shook hands and I handed over the oil-stained registration. I never thought I'd sell my aircraft, but two weeks earlier we had discovered Marie was pregnant. We did some math, drawing up a budget. Rent in San Francisco and a child we could afford, but hangar fees and aircraft maintenance would put us in the red. The katana had to go. That night, Marie and I stood on the deck of our apartment and took turns looking through a telescope she had given me for Christmas. As a boy, I had been fascinated with space, leading me to my dream job as a NASA engineer. But since I'd probably never have the chance to visit Mars or even the lunar colony, I got my pilot's license. It wasn't the same, but flying had provided me an authentic joy. Marie looked into my eyes, took my hand, and squeezed it. We had prepared ourselves for a new set of adventures, and we were eager to experience them together. Part 1. Chapter 1. 2071, California. July 20th, 2071. This was the day NASA started a war. I stepped out of the car in San Francisco to the familiar smell of fresh coffee and homeless people. A musician sat on a bucket playing a saxophone, his music echoing between the buildings. I walked down Market Street toward the Embarcadero, grateful for the chance to stretch my legs. It can be a long drive from NASA's Mountain View Research Center, and driverless vehicles always obey the speed limit. I glanced up at the ferry building. Fog hovered around the clock tower. The sun would burn it off soon. San Fran's mornings were always a bit chilly. I stepped into a cafe, grabbing a coffee. 
When I left the shop, I walked back to the musician and passed my wristwatch over his case, transferring a few dollars. Three blocks away, the Transbay Transit Center's glass facade twinkled as the sun broke through the clouds. I walked there, enjoying the hot coffee while pigeons dodged my feet. Usually, I'd stroll through the station's five-acre rooftop garden, but not today. I jogged down the escalator and boarded a train. Cameras inspected my eyes, billing me for the ticket as metallic doors clanged shut behind me. My body pressed into a cloth seat as we rocketed out of the Bay Area. I held my coffee in the air to prevent it from spilling. My tablet clung to the seat back like a magnet on a fridge. I was about to start working when my phone chimed. It was my wife. She called every day around the same time, the calls so routine I took them for granted. Marie and I had met at George Washington University when she was a junior and I a senior. We took a film studies class together, spending our evenings watching classic sci-fi movies and falling in love. When the semester ended, we watched three movies a week until the day we were married, three years later. I slid the phone from my wristwatch and my son's face filled the display. Hey, dude, I said. Branson was two and a half years old. His brown hair was a mess and needed to be trimmed. Dada, he replied. Branson struggled in my wife's arms as she pulled him back from the camera. Dada on loop, he said, looking up at his mother. That's right, buddy, I said, leaning forward and smiling. I had left for work before either Branson or Marie had woken up. Did you brush your teeth this morning? Branson nodded enthusiastically. He loved the Hyperloop and laughed every time we rode the super-fast train. I guess he thought of it as an amusement park ride. I had driven to L.A. twice since we moved to California. Driving to L.A. is kind of a pain and takes about six hours. The fastest route used to be Interstate 5, but since the cartel expanded in the Central Valley, I tried to avoid that route, not wanting to be mistaken for a government official or the DEA. Sword, Branson said, holding an action figure in one hand and an oversized plastic sword in the other. The figurine had huge eyes, dark skin, and wore a turban. The toy was from his favorite Disney movie, Mongol, the one about the boy who was tired of pillaging. Johnny, come home early as you can. Marie's voice sounded soft and pleasant, but also tired. She'd taken time off from teaching genetic anthropology at UC Berkeley and got cabin fever from being at home while I was away. Marie grabbed my son's hand to prevent him from pulling out her braids. She had done her hair in loops like Princess Leia in The Empire Strikes Back. I'll try, but it could be another late night. Marie frowned, then covered it with a smile. She wasn't looking forward to another evening watching Disney characters dance around the Hall of Vision. I'll make it up to you. On my next trip, you can join me in L.A. and we'll go to Griffith Park together. We'll take Branson to the observatory. It'll be great, I promise. This seemed to satisfy Marie, at least a little. After ending the call, I opened the blueprints for Destiny Colony, currently under construction in Earth orbit. The name symbolized humanity's future as a spacefaring species. I twisted my hand in the air, rotating the view on the screen. The design had been a staple in science fiction, a two-mile-wide rotating ring. It was time to make the dream a reality. Construction of a space station is as much about accounting as engineering. Launching from Earth is the most expensive method, so this was kept to a minimum. The aluminum was mined on the moon, while other raw materials, various silicates, carbonate, and oxides, came from Mars. Six months ago, a spacecraft named the CTS Bradbury had been in orbit above the surface of Mars. The Bradbury, an unmanned cargo vessel the size of ten Carnival cruise ships, was loaded with enough material to complete Destiny Colony. The ship and its massive payload blasted towards Earth at 50,000 miles per hour, accelerating further as it fell deeper into the sun's gravity well. Today, six months after leaving Mars, it would arrive. Stepping out of Union Station in Los Angeles, I took in the blue sky and breathed the fresh air. I could hear the gentle hum of electric cars racing along the San Bernardino Freeway. In the distance, the skyline was laced with the vertical farms that provided California with an effectively unlimited supply of food. Almost half of L.A.'s population was free-living, and it was obvious wherever you looked. It was the middle of a workday, and dozens of the non-working middle-class people sat outside Union Station, enjoying the sun. I jumped into a car with Nicholas, a young engineer from Houston. Nicholas was fairly new to NASA, fresh off his internship. He had been assigned to me to help with logistics. I was an electrical systems engineer by trade, but NASA required its engineers to do a stint in logistics. Nicholas was a quintessential engineer. He wore a short-sleeved white shirt with a pocket protector for his phone. He always wore slacks, even though most of us wore jeans. And he wore glasses, a recent retro trend, and as far as I could tell, his only concession to style. The car sped north on Highway 101. Palm trees lined the freeway and the Hollywood sign loomed in the distance. 
The original sign had been replaced after the 2042 quake and a new and bigger sign sat in its place. Nicholas ignored the scenery, concentrating instead on the bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic speeding along at 70 miles per hour. He had a childlike curiosity, studying the algorithms the autocars used to optimize the traffic patterns, allowing us to travel anywhere in central LA in less than 10 minutes. Do you think you'll get to go into space? Nicholas asked as we approached NASA's spacecraft operations center. Probably not, but I've always wanted to. I had a pilot's license, was an engineer, and worked for NASA. In a sense, my resume suited me for a job in Earth orbit or the Martian colony. How about you? I asked. Nah, he responded. Never thought of myself as an astronaut. This surprised me. I pictured him in space, staring out in childlike awe from Destiny's control room. You know they don't call anyone who goes into space an astronaut, I said. Thousands of people have been to space. Nicholas gave me a serious look. And so few understand how amazing that is. I nodded my agreement. We left the car in northeast Los Angeles near Pasadena and headed into the lobby of NASA's Watney Building. The car drove back onto the boulevard in search of its next customer. We rode the elevator to the control room on the 13th floor. The elevator's window granted us an outside view. Griffith Observatory rested on the hill in the distance. I imagined holding Branson up to the eyepieces of the historic telescopes. We stepped out of the elevator and walked through a set of double doors into mission control. A confident-looking man wearing a white vest welcomed us as we walked down the aisle between the stations. Today's the big day, John, Norman said, smiling and patting me on the back. Norman Kim, the flight director, stood well over six feet tall. He had to be over 60, but rumor had it he could still dunk a basketball and was savage on the court. This was our second time meeting in person. The fact that he remembered my name was moving. We get this shipment in orbit and you guys can get to work. It's about time, I joked. The shipment was on schedule, down to the nearest second. I introduced Nicholas and Norman. Norman always made an effort to inspire NASA's young engineers. He asked Nicholas how he had gotten interested in space and how he ended up at NASA. The two of them continued to make small talk as I settled into my station. I looked around the room and realized that everyone was smiling. In fact, they were almost giddy. Everyone was excited for the supplies to arrive from Mars, but even more excited to finish building Destiny Colony. Today's plan was simple. The CTS Bradbury would park in geostationary orbit. Once there, the logistics team, which included me and Nicholas, would take over. We were in charge of ferrying the supplies from the CTS Bradbury to Destiny's construction site 36,000 kilometers above the Galapagos Islands. We watched the projection at the front of the room. A telescopic camera in a high orbit gave us live images of the spacecraft as it approached the orbital insertion burn point. Excuse me, Norman said as he and Nicholas ceased their conversation. He brushed past us and headed to the front of the room. From there, he gave a quick pep talk. Ladies and gentlemen, he began. Since the days of Isaac Asimov, engineers like us have dreamed of the day we could construct the first rotating space station. Today, we are poised to make that dream a reality. He paused, letting the gravity of our mission sink in. Once the CTS Bradbury settles into orbit, I will start this clock. He pointed to a digital countdown clock on the wall that read, 1,095 days, 0 hours, 0 minutes, 0 seconds. Three years from today, we will open the airlock to a new chapter in human history. The room erupted into cheers, but Norman held up his hand to silence it. People of NASA, contractors and friends, let's make history. At that moment, there was a hustle and bustle as engineers tapped away on their consoles. Additional screens flickered on, showing immense amounts of data. For the next hour, we worked through dozens of checklists. Norman read from a tablet requesting the status of each system. After each request, someone in the room would shout, Nominal. The time came to inject the Bradbury into Earth's orbit. There was a countdown which included another checklist, but instead of responding with nominal, everyone responded, Go flight. It was time. Retro rockets firing, said an engineer. An animation on the screen showed four jets of rocket flame shooting from the giant spacecraft's engines. Trajectory nominal, said a female voice. I glanced at another display which plotted the path of the ship into Earth's orbit. Pitch nominal. Attitude nominal. Navigation. Wait, said a man seated in the row ahead of me. He sat at a radar station. I looked at his screen trying to see what he was looking at. This was a critical moment in the flight, and my heart rate quickened. Wait, there's something on the radar. It's small, about the size of a baseball. I still couldn't see what he was looking at. The engineer pushed his head closer to the screen, trying to get a read. At the speeds that these spaceships traveled, debris of any size was a threat. But space is very empty, and spacecraft rarely hit anything larger than a grain of sand. Switch to dorsal camera, Norman ordered.
The views on a half dozen screens showed the top half of the freighter. We all saw it, a piece of space junk streaking through space at incredible speed. We watched as the object grazed both the liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen tanks. I didn't realize it, but I was standing. Nicholas put a hand on my shoulder, guiding me back into my chair. It'll be all right, John, he whispered, always the optimist. I tried to wrap my mind around it. NASA monitored most of the space junk in the Earth's vicinity. The trajectory calculations always took debris into consideration. Zoom in on that fuel tank, Norman ordered, pointing at the room's primary display. The screen zoomed in, revealing a small impact hole with hydrogen leaking out. The gas appearing to glow as it streamed out into space, trailing ahead of the craft as the main engine slowed down the giant spacecraft. Can we shut down those tanks? Norman asked. Affirmative flight, tank shutdown complete, increasing flow from the remaining tanks, someone reported. I spoke up. We should shut down the thrusters until the gases disperse, I yelled, hating myself for not speaking up sooner. Do it, Norman yelled, but it was too late. The live views of the spacecraft turned white. I stared in disbelief. Something had overwhelmed the cameras. Error messages flashed all over the displays. We are still getting data, someone said, but it looks like we've had an explosion. I'm patching in another video feed now. We watched as millions of pounds of fuel erupted in pulsing spheres of blinding light. I slunk down in my chair and pinched my temples, using my hand to hide my tears. I'd poured my heart and soul into this mission. I'd worked long hours, time I could have spent playing with my son. And for what? A 30-second fireworks show? I felt worthless. This was compounded by the fact that there was nothing for me to do. If this mission failed, I had no reason to be here. It's off course, the telemetry engineer said. On one of the large screens, we watched a simulation showing the hunk of spacecraft veering off its projected course by two degrees. Estimated trajectory? The flight director whispered to the telemetry engineer. This was an important question. I perked up, trying to hear, dying to know where the unguided spacecraft was headed. Calculating now, flight, she replied. Give me two minutes. Engines? Norman asked the room. Offline, said an engineer. We're not getting any readings from the fuel tanks. My guess is that we lost the fuel in the explosion. All of it? All of it, flight. Cycle the cameras, Norman ordered. Let's see if there's anything good on the spacecraft. Someone in the room cycled through the Bradbury's cameras like a slideshow. A large cloud of debris surrounded the spacecraft. Burned chunks of metal floated around it in an expanding sphere. Through the debris field, we could see the bulk of the spacecraft from a high vantage point, probably from a mast camera of some type. The majority of the spacecraft's mass seemed relatively unaffected by the explosion. Do any of the thrusters work? The flight director asked. We have two functioning starboard thrusters and three port thrusters. However, with the main engines, we can only change our orientation, not our trajectory. Understood, he responded. Okay, everyone, is there any chance we can salvage this? Norman had my full attention again. Sir, if the Bradbury enters a stable orbit, we'll be able to dock with it using a tow shuttle and eventually pull it back into the correct orbit, suggested one of the engineers. For a moment, I felt a glimmer of hope. I looked over at Nicholas. He was seated, resting his head on his hands as if listening to a fascinating speech. The young engineer's eyes glistened. I'm sure he and I felt exactly the same way. That's not going to happen, the telemetry engineer said, using a hand to brush her hair behind an ear. We're not going to get a stable orbit. What's the result, Elena? Norman said, using the engineer's first name, a rare event in mission control. Well, sir, the Bradbury is, well, it's headed straight for the Earth. Chapter 2. Impact Damn it, Norman muttered. Any chance it will miss? This changed everything. It was a silly question. The telemetry reports were never wrong. If Elena said the spaceship was headed for Earth, you could be damn sure it was going to hit the Earth. I felt like I was going to die, as if the spacecraft was going to land right on top of this building. No, sir, Elena said. Probability is 100%. Updating visuals now. Everyone looked to the front of the room. The primary display showed an animation with the path of the spacecraft leading straight to Earth. Mr. Collins, bring up the procedure for self-destruct, the flight director ordered. Several people in the room gasped, and there were tears in people's eyes. Self-destruct sequence on your mark, flight, an engineer in the back of the room said. Mark, Norman said. Nothing happened. Mr. Collins, update, please. With the debris field dispersing, the Bradbury superstructure came clearly into view. If you weren't looking closely, you almost didn't see the damage. Sir, we're not getting a response from the detonators. How about a workaround? Norman asked, pacing up the hallway between the workstations. I don't think so, Collins said. It looks like the main bus was destroyed in the explosion, sort of like Apollo 13. Shit, Norman swore. Lock the doors. 
During most emergencies, the lock the doors command is the first command given after a disaster. It had been so long since the last major incident in space, I guess he just forgot to say it. His expletive did not do the situation justice. The CTS Bradbury was a giant hunk of steel, 10 million tons in mass. It was about to hit Earth traveling at tens of thousands of miles per hour. We knew one thing for sure. The spacecraft was going to hit this side of the planet. We had timed the arrival so that it would be over North America. This reduced communication lag. All geostationary orbits are over the equator, so it would probably hit the tropics, with a margin of error of 30-something degrees. This put a potential impact zone within the continental United States. When the news leaked, there would be panic. The standard procedure in a NASA emergency was to halt communication with the outside world. This gave the communications team time to align on a consistent message. I slunk down in my chair and pulled out my phone, shooting a text to my wife. Epic disaster with spacecraft. Impact with Earth imminent. Get out of SF. Drive north. Tell no one. Just go. I love you. Marie knew the risks. I discussed my work every day over dinner. She knew the ramifications of a rogue spacecraft better than most. She also understood that when the news got out that a spaceship was going to land on their heads, people would panic and act irrationally. The phone dinged. A text. I love you. Norman looked over at me and frowned. He walked to the back of the room and picked up a trash can, dumping the contents on the floor. A half-empty coffee cup rolled under my workstation, leaving a helical pattern of cold coffee on the floor. Mr. Johnson, he said and held out the trash can to the security man. He raised his voice and said, All right, people, the doors are locked. You know what it means. Johnson walked from workstation to workstation, and people dropped their phones, tablets, and watches in. Anything that could call or message out. Thank you, everyone, Norman said, pacing between the workstations. Time to impact. Forty-five minutes flight. I need a location, Elena. Hard to say. Elena had a habit of speaking quietly. Norman leaned in to hear her better. Twenty minutes, at least. When Elena spoke, the whole room quieted down. But like everyone else in the room, she was one of the best. Flight, I'm getting dozens of emails from the press, said a voice from one of the stations. The live feed was broadcast on NASA 3D. Wonderful, Norman said. What should I tell them, sir? said the communications director. Tell them we've had an anomaly on board the spacecraft. That's it? That's it, Norman replied. Let's just pray it comes down in the water somewhere. And if it hits near a major city? Someone asked, speaking without formally addressing the director. Then God help us, Norman responded. For twenty minutes, the room reverberated with the sounds of a dozen engineers debating vectors and the other directors coordinating with the Air Force. Ideas flew around the room like sparrows trapped in a chimney. Shoot it down, I heard someone say. Can't launch a missile without accurate telemetry, said another. Wouldn't matter anyway, this thing is just too damn large. Shut up, everyone, someone yelled from the front of the room. Everyone shut up. The room went silent. We have an impact site and it's confirmed, Elena said. Let's hear it, Norman ordered. 36.8 degrees north, she said, and 119.7 degrees west. No one spoke. A bead of sweat trickled down the engineer's face. All eyes turned to the map. Northern California, Norman said. Just north of Fresno Flight, right in the middle of the Central Valley. Only 200 miles from here, I thought. Fresno had, what, a half a million people? Jesus. Jerry, Norman said and motioned to the communications director. Spread the word. As news of the impending collision spread around the world, a holovision on the left side of the control room played the news. CTS Bradbury expected to impact Fresno, California, was the headline. A reporter from ABC News paraphrased our press release. This ship containing billions of pounds of material will ram into Earth at 60,000 miles per hour. According to NASA, shockwaves could travel for hundreds of miles, reaching San Francisco and even Los Angeles. We were in serious trouble. Nick, I whispered. Hey, Nicholas, he looked over. We need to get the hell out of here. We're locked in, Nicholas whispered back. He was right. We were stuck in there. Most of the people in the room had a job to do. They had an obligation to stay, to keep working the problem. All I wanted to do was get to my family. I read the ticker displayed beneath the commentators. Subterranean rail and hyperloops will be halted in 30 minutes in anticipation of massive earthquakes. I figured they would send most of the trains away from the cities while they had time. I definitely wouldn't want to be on a train when the spaceship impacted. Another headline. Traffic insanity. Drivers override vehicle automation systems causing major congestion. I thought about this for a moment. After 30 years of automation, there was an entire generation who had never learned to drive. Did Marie have enough warning to get ahead of the congestion? I didn't know. Flight, can we have our phones back? I asked, desperate to get a hold of Marie. 
I looked around the room, noticing other people sitting around with nothing to do. Johnson, give them back their phones, Norman said. I reached into the trash can and grabbed my phone. In a panic, I sprinted to the back of the room and called my wife. She had been listening to the news reports and knew almost as much as I did. How bad is it? She asked, and without waiting for an answer said, There are car accidents everywhere. It's bad, I said, and we don't know how bad. The blast radius could be anywhere from 50 to 300 miles and we expect earthquakes, big ones. Oh, John, how could this happen? She said. Let's just focus on the problem, I said. Where are you? Santa Rosa. Marie, we need to make a decision, I said. You can stay on the highway and risk the drivers, or you can head west into the hills and try to avoid the blast that way. I think I'll head into the hills, she said. When this is over, we may not have working cell phones. San Francisco and Los Angeles will be a mess. If we lose contact, meet me in Las Vegas. And I don't know, how about the Bellagio? The mountains should protect Las Vegas. Can you do that? I'll do my best. I love you, Marie said. Someone in the room patched in video from ground-based observatories and satellites in geostationary orbit. The spaceship's hull started to glow as it entered the atmosphere. There were no windows in the control room, but we were informed that the spacecraft could be seen from Los Angeles and that the entire population was outside, looking up. Someone yelled, Open the goddamn doors! Several people had gathered at the back of the room, where a row of doors led to a hallway on the north side of the building. Norman flicked a finger at the guard and nodded his head. Johnson pulled out his keys and opened each of the doors, allowing natural light to stream into the room. I ran to the window and looked up. Earth had a second sun. The CTS Bradbury appeared as a giant orange orb in the sky, with a tail of debris stretching out like a comet. It descended lower and lower and eventually passed out of sight behind the hills. The news stations showed live views of the crashing spaceship. There were holovisions in the hallway, and every network had camera crews following the doomed craft. Suddenly, all of the news feeds winked out, and the broadcasts returned to the commentators at their home stations in faraway cities. Nicholas stood beside me, shaking. He was more afraid than I was. Perhaps he understood the implications better than I. Nicholas was slightly overweight and reminded me of a kid on the playground after he'd been bullied. We gave the world 20 minutes notice, he said. 20 minutes to gather your things and run. But it's not going to matter, is it? People are still going to burn. If the spacecraft had impacted where telemetry had predicted, the San Joaquin Valley was a crater. I looked back at the data screens in the control room. We had live satellite images of the impact zone. The spacecraft didn't impact with a ball of flame like I would have imagined. It was a reddish-brown cloud, a giant plume of opacity, billions of tons of sedimentary rock thrown up into the atmosphere. An air shock rippled the clouds as it traveled north up the valley and toward the ocean, to the place where my wife was fighting the traffic. No, no, no! I thought of Branson. He must be so scared. No, he was too young to understand what was going on. He probably even enjoyed the ride as they raced through the northern California hills. I knew my wife. She was a strong woman and could compose herself in the most stressful situations. I pictured her in my mind's eye, focusing intensely on getting to safety, making me proud to be her husband. I refocused on the display in the control room. The shockwave was headed our way, too. Live data from the United States Geological Survey projected onto the screen. The data showed earthquakes all over the United States. Red numbers in yellow boxes representing the Richter scale popped up in an expanding ring around the impact site. There were eights, tens, and even a few elevens, the highest possible number on the scale. This scared me more than anything had in my entire life. Sometimes it's not the event itself that's terrifying, but the anticipation. We felt a shudder go through the building. A P-wave, the first sign of an approaching megaquake. The building's earthquake early warning system roared. Everyone out, out, out! Johnson yelled from the nearest stairwell. He held open the door as people rushed out. Nicholas and I rushed into the stairwell as the power went out, stumbling down the 13 floors in the dark. Chapter 3. Shockwaves We made it to the lobby as the first shockwave hit L.A. The sky darkened as debris filled the air. There was a loud boom and the sound of shattering glass resonated through the building. We stayed in the building until the glass stopped falling. Nicholas and I struggled to maintain our balance as an earthquake shook the lobby. People from the control room pooled around us as we rushed to get outside. On the street, traffic was at a standstill. Members of the press were waiting for us, ready to bombard NASA employees with questions. Another earthquake hit, and we used the distraction to avoid the press. 
Outside, people were running away from any structure that might collapse, avoiding burst water mains and broken glass. Another tremor rocked the ground, this one much more intense than the last. I looked back from where we'd come. The pillars of NASA's Watney building swayed to the left, then to the right before snapping like matchsticks. The building crumbled to the ground. We ran towards the hills a mile away, hoping that the lack of infrastructure would provide safety from the collapsing buildings. Maintaining balance was tricky as we ran across the shaking ground. The earth continued to shake and giant cracks formed in the road. I was a runner, but my legs ached with the extra effort. I had Nicholas by the arm and was dragging him forward. Chunks of roadway the size of buses collapsed into the sewers while dirt and grime shot into the air. The structures on either side of us shook off their foundations and the rubble continued to tremble. We ran up the hill and reached the Roosevelt Golf Course. The irrigation lines had burst and pools of water covered the fairways. Another shock wave hit, an air shock and earthquake all at once. The air shock blew me off my feet and onto my back. I slid across the green, looking up in time to see Griffith Observatory blown to pieces. The three astronomical domes flew into the air while the bricks, mortar, dirt, and debris blew down off the hillside toward us. I leapt to my feet, surrounded by sinkholes as pieces of the observatory rained down. Nicholas! I yelled. People scattered all over the fairway. Nicholas lay nearby, stunned. I grabbed his arm, using all my strength to raise him to his feet. We continued our sprint across the greens as chunks of observatory rained down, leaving basketball-sized holes in the muddy ground. I saw it out of the corner of my eye, but it was too late. A cinder block punched Nicholas in the back at 200 miles per hour, driving his body deep into the mud. He disappeared into the sludge. I tried to pull him out, digging with my hands as mud and gunk pooled in around my knees. My arms ached, but I kept digging, reaching into the muck, trying to grab an arm or piece of clothing to drag his body to the surface. The debris no longer rained down. I looked about, realizing I was up to my waist in dark brown water. Nicholas was gone. I could feel the adrenaline shooting through my veins. I'd never witnessed anyone die before, and I was surprised that I didn't feel grief, only anger. I looked around at all the people. Some had serious injuries, while some carried their injured friends. Some just looked stunned. I unclicked my phone from my watch. The screen was caked with mud. I tried my best to wipe it clean, dipping it in the water. The phone was waterproof, but I had no bars. I put it back. I climbed northward, higher into the hills. Tears streamed down my face. I turned around to face the city, slouched down, and took in the view. The sky was a pinkish brown with patches of black. Smoke billowed from a thousand fires, and the air was thick with the smell of burning plastic and raw sewage. A gas line burst into flames and then fizzled out. I could see Los Angeles International Airport in the distance, a pile of double-decker A380s and part of the terminal lay jumbled at the bottom of a sinkhole. Not a single building stood more than a few stories high in all of downtown L.A., and Santa Monica was underwater. The city resembled a trash heap in a third-world country. I watched as fires burned, only to be extinguished by rising sewer water. A siren blared in the distance and then stopped. For a moment, all was silent in Griffith Park. I looked at my watch. It was only 6 p.m., and sunset wasn't for a few more hours, but the sky had grown dark. I contemplated using my phone's flashlight, but I wanted to conserve power on the off chance we got signal back. I paced around the park near the observatory, trying to work out my options. Going back down into the city was far too dangerous. Several people were already on the hill, probably tourists visiting the observatory and free livers who had been enjoying their ample free time in the park. I walked from person to person, asking if anyone needed help and administered first aid where I could. Most people just wanted to be alone. I slept, or at least took shelter that night, in the remains of the observatory. What else was I supposed to do? I awoke early the next morning to the sound of horns blaring in the distance, the sound a ship makes when it comes into port. I got up and looked towards the ocean. Aircraft carriers lined the shore. They must have arrived from San Diego. A squadron of helicopters and other vertical takeoff and landing aircraft swarmed over the city, picking people off mounds of rubble, taking the survivors back to the ships. I could see thousands of men and women in military uniform searching through the debris. A large military helicopter landed on the plateau where Griffith Observatory used to be. I recognized the helicopter. NASA had a few of them for recovering spacecraft that landed at sea. The helicopter was the Sikorsky Super Stallion, which, in its current configuration, could carry 75 passengers in airline-type seats. 
I boarded the helicopter with about 50 or 60 others through the large hatch at the rear. I went to the front and leaned into the cockpit. The co-pilot seat was unoccupied. They must be short on pilots, I thought. Hey, I said to the captain. I'm a pilot. Mind if I join you up here? Have a seat, boss, he said. Commander Avery Garcia. Call me Avro. He reached out and shook my hand. He looked to be younger than me by five or six years, and though he was seated, I guessed he was a few inches taller as well, but maybe that was just the helmet. Avro, I said, repeating the call sign and committing it to memory. John Orville. Avro then leaned out of his seat, looking back into the cabin. His straps were loose, and wires dangled from his helmet. The wires connected his radio transmitter and helmet-mounted heads-up display to the console. He pressed a black button on the control stick, activating the helicopter's PA system. Find a seat and strap the hell in, he said over the PA. He then hit another set of switches. The tail ramp retracted and the helicopter's turbofan engines spooled up. The sound of gyros filled the cockpit as the instruments came online. A second later, the first rotor whooshed overhead. After another rotation, the rotors spun so fast they were invisible, and the sound of the gyros was replaced by the chop-chop-chop sound that gave helicopters their nickname. Here's the deal said Avro through the PA system. I'm taking you to the aircraft carrier USS Enterprise 3. From there, you'll get a connecting flight to Denver, Seattle, Phoenix, Dallas, or Las Vegas. Once we land, go to one of the computer terminals on the deck and log in. List any family members you believe were on the West Coast. The computer will select the destination where you will most likely be reconnected with any survivors. You can either take the computer's recommendation or choose one of the five cities on your own. Please direct any questions to the officers on deck when we reach the Enterprise. Avro clicked off the PA as he piloted the aircraft toward the sea. So, where are you from? he asked. Washington, D.C. I've been working at Ames near San Francisco. NASA? Shit, man. You're not going to be very popular. No kidding, I responded. I needed to remind myself to stop telling people that. Maybe I needed an alternative identity. Maybe I could say I sold life insurance. No one, absolutely no one, wants to hear about life insurance. My wife and son were in San Francisco. I told them to drive north. Do you have any idea how hard that area was hit? Smart, Avro said. San Fran's in worse shape than L.A. There's trouble up north, I can tell you that. What kind of trouble? I asked, feeling a lump in my throat. The cartel thinks the impact was intentional, like it was a government plot or something. The rescue helicopters are taking small arms fire. We've been able to approach the downtown cores of L.A. and San Fran, but we're taking hits from everywhere else. I thought the cartel was contained. I had no idea they had influence near the coast. They didn't until now. Conspiracy theories are powerful things, Avro said. I guess they mobilized a number of sympathizers and are paying folks to stick around and act as human shields. I knew the cartel had money, and lots of it. The government had reinvigorated the war on drugs, driving up the market price of street drugs. This provided a massive influx of cash for the cartel. Governments never seemed to learn from history. This was exactly how the cartel got started back in the 2020s. I told my wife to meet me in Vegas. Log in like everyone else, buddy. You'll be in Vegas later today. Your family will meet you there. Thanks, I said, not convinced it could be so simple. You said you're a pilot? Avro asked. Private pilot, I said. IFR rated. After you connect with your family, call me, Avro said. We could use your help with SAR. I will, I said, pretty sure I was out of a job. Chapter 4. Eddie Rizzo after a two-hour flight on a large military jump jet, I arrived in Vegas. A data terminal at McLaren Airport indicated that Marie hadn't checked in. I leaned against the wall, staring at the floor and frozen with grief. Hey, said a voice over my shoulder. There's an app for that. Huh? I responded, turning around to see a young man in a blue vest. The man must have been an airport employee. An app for connecting with your family, he said. FEMA set it up. Same database as those terminals. Thanks, I said. Looking at my phone, I realized it had a signal again. I told it, download FEMA app. The Federal Emergency Management Agency's logo appeared on the screen. The application asked permission to access all my social media accounts, including location identifiers. I said yes to all the messages. The app contained more information than the kiosk. It let me know that my wife had not accessed social media and was not using her phone's location services. I stumbled towards the wall and slid to the airport floor, my gut wrenching with grief and worry. Other people sat along the walls crying. Some just walked down the aisles as if it were a normal day at the airport. Airport security walked the halls, telling people to move along. I had to get to the hotel anyway, so I followed orders. The auto car system in Vegas functioned without issue, and I summoned a ride to the hotel. Leaving the airport, I realized that Las Vegas was relatively unaffected by the impact. 
Granted, they had experienced earthquakes, but nothing over the sixth magnitude. I noticed large cracks in the roadways and dozens of broken windows, but this was Vegas. It could have been like that before the impact. I looked out the car's window and saw the theme park over the New York, New York casino. It reminded me of Branson. This was another place I'd promised to take my family someday. I stopped looking outside and I tried to focus on something else. In my head, I estimated how many people had escaped from L.A. There were hundreds of helicopters and a few dozen jump jets, but L.A. had millions of people. It was clear that this disaster was the worst in the nation's history. I gave up on the calculations as the car pulled up to the Bellagio. I'd been to Vegas before and stayed here at the Bellagio once with Marie. The lobby was exquisite, with grand arches and contemporary art. I was surprised the staff let me in. I looked like shit, mud caked all over my body. Fortunately, I wasn't the first evacuee to come looking for a hotel room. Sir, sir, said a bellboy. Can I help you? I, I almost said no. I could use some clothes. Here. I handed him two hundreds. Thirty-four waist, medium shirts. The bellman took the bills and looked at them. I kept them in my wallet for emergencies. No one used cash anymore, but it was still legal tender and stores had to accept it. At the front desk, I asked the hotel manager if he'd seen my wife. It was improbable that she had arrived before me, but I asked anyway. I tapped my phone on the desk and booked the last vacant room. I sat down on the bed and pulled off a shoe. The bellboy appeared at the door carrying a bag with Gap printed on the side. $180, the young man said. Keep the change, I said. $20 wasn't much of a tip. The kid probably didn't make much more than a free liver's wage. What was that, 50 bucks an hour? At least 20 could buy him a beer. The bellboy nodded thanks, excused himself, and walked back down the hall. I opened the plastic bag and pulled out the first item, a shirt, still warm from the printer. Its light blue coloring and oriental design was moderately tasteful. A navy blue sports jacket and blue jeans completed my new wardrobe. In the bottom of the bag, I found two pairs of socks and two pairs of underwear. The items smelled of hot polyester, so I placed them on the bed to air out while I took a shower. After the shower, I sat on the bed and transferred the phone's FEMA application to the hotel's Holovision. There were no recent notifications. Marie and Branson were either still driving or they were... I couldn't finish the thought. 38 million people were listed in the database, with only 20 million people accounted for. Of these, 200,000 were listed as deceased. 200,000. Good God, I thought. I searched for Nicholas Francis. A relative had listed him as missing. I selected Edit from a menu and entered the following information. Last known location, Roosevelt Golf Course, East Los Angeles. Last known health status, drop-down box, deceased. Cause of death, submenu, drop-down box, blunt force trauma. Relation, drop-down box, co-worker. I closed Nicholas's record, hoping someone would recover the body. I reloaded the previous menu, watching as the casualty count creeped upward. I wanted to throw up. I wondered if my mother had checked this. If she did, she'd find out that I was alive, but that Marie and Branson were missing. Mom was still pissed I'd joined NASA, an organization she believed was a waste of her tax dollars. I didn't bother calling her. I was already too pissed off. Google owned several satellites that provided high-quality images of Earth. The images were live, but as I zoomed into California, thick brown clouds rendered the images useless. The news coverage was sporadic, but one report showed a steady flow of helicopters taking survivors out of San Francisco. It was painful to search social media. Without cell coverage in the affected areas, the posts were limited to people in the same situation as me. People posted photos of missing loved ones or images of their evacuation, but that was it. Hashtag NASA's fault was trending. I spent an hour looking for updates from Sonoma County. This was my best guess as to where Marie and Branson were at the time of the impact. From what I gathered from people's location tags, most of the roads were impassable due to avalanches and sinkholes. If Marie and Branson were on their way to Vegas, it wasn't by car. By evening, cell coverage had returned to some of the affected areas, and there was a new trend on social media. The cartel was preventing people from leaving, preventing them from evacuating. People posted videos of armed men standing in rows across stretches of crumbling pavement. My depression turned to rage. My body started shaking from the anxiety. I was angry with NASA for screwing up the mission. I was angry with myself for being part of it. Most of all, I was angry at the cartel for being, well, the cartel, for being stupid enough to think this catastrophe was intentional and for putting my family's lives in danger. Was there anything I could do? I remembered what Avro had said. They needed search and rescue pilots. I sent him a text. No sign of family. Sign me up for SAR. When he texted back, the message read, 
Meet me at Nellis Air Force Base tomorrow at 0730. BYO Aircraft. Bring my own aircraft? I thought, shit. I called Henderson Airfield and asked if they had an aircraft for rent. It was late and a touring operator took my call. Officially, all the aircraft had been rented, but the operator said I could stop by the flight club and talk to the pilots, so I grabbed an auto car and headed to the airfield. Several pilots sat in the flying club's lounge. When I approached the group, they were talking about California. It's a mess, said a female pilot. She looked exhausted. The four bars on her shoulder meant that she was a captain. Another pilot seated nearby wore a similar uniform with three bars. He must have been the co-pilot. Past Death Valley ain't nothing but death, said an older man seated at the lounge's bar. I told the room I was looking for a plane. Everyone stopped their conversations to listen to my plea. It was embarrassing. I felt like a beggar on the metro telling some sob story and asking for cash. The old man at the bar motioned for me to talk to him. Apparently, a prospector named Eddie Rizzo owned an electroglider he'd used for surveying. Electrogliders are like flying hybrid electric cars, but while hybrid cars recharge their batteries while braking, electrogliders recharged while descending or by flying through rising air. Eddie stored the aircraft in a hangar nearby, and if I bugged him, he might just let me borrow it, for a fee. The man showed me to a door and pointed to Eddie's hangar. It was dark, but the building was illuminated by the parking lot's lighting. A sign hung over the hangar's door and read, We Buy Gold. I found Eddie Rizzo sitting in a cubicle-sized office behind a stack of a dozen broken tablet computers. He smoked a long silver electronic cigarette which I could tell had some kick. His office stank of real cigars. He wore a weathered brown leather jacket over a faded white t-shirt. Eddie spoke with a strong New York accent. So, you're looking for an aircraft. Going to join SAR, are you? You want to be a hero? That's the plan, I said, taking short breaths to avoid tasting the office's stench. Here's the deal, buddy. I've got the only aircraft west of Colorado that wasn't messed the hell up in today's apocalypse. If you want my baby, you better have the dough. When Eddie said the word baby, my eyes shot to his grotesque gut. It looked like Eddie was about to have twins. How much? I didn't believe him that it was the only aircraft available. It was a classic sales pitch. Tell the client you have the last product in town, buy it now, or forever hold your peace. Well, seeing as this here's the last plane, I'd say demand is quite high. The plane is rather valuable. You know what I'm saying? But not as valuable as the shit on the other side of those there mountains. What do you mean? Eddie's comment caught me off guard. Another salesman trick? No. He wanted something more than money, and I worried I was getting in over my head. This was Vegas, where desperate people get extorted. Well, it seems to me that Cali's population has declined and the leftovers are up for grabs. So here's the deal. The plane is yours for 100000 a month, but you gotta do something for me. You're gonna use this equipment. He pointed to a pile of junk on the table. And survey every square inch of the Golden State. If there's a gold ring in someone's dresser, my scanners will find it. And if you see a corpse with a Rolex or an abandoned Royce, you let me know and I'll send my boys to pick it up. $100,000 is a bit steep, I said. $100,000 would max out my savings. After that, I'd be living on charity. Eddie probably figured that a SAR operation would operate in grids. He was probably right. This would provide the optimal data set for his survey. He needed someone like me. I'll tell you what, you flag some good shit, I'll give you a finder's fee of 1%. I began to see Eddie as the typical pawn shop owner. They start by throwing out a highball figure to see if you bite. If you're a good negotiator, you don't. You let them talk themselves down, then keep them hanging. I want to see the aircraft. Eddie gestured with his thumb to a wooden door behind his desk. I squeezed past a four-foot-tall pile of magazines, holding my breath as I got a whiff of Eddie's sweat and cigar funk. The door led to the hangar where I found an aircraft covered in canvas. I pulled the cover off the electroglider and ran my hand along a faded white fuselage. The name Moneta was stenciled just below the canopy. The plane had to be 30 years old, a classic, but it seemed to be in workable condition. Made by Augusta Westland, its stingray-like design had been influenced by the bicycle makers of Casina Costa in northern Italy. This also gave the aircraft its nickname. The stingray had two large thrust regen fans embedded in the root of each wing. Each fan had three blades that were at least eight feet long. They provided thrust yet could also act as windmills generating electricity to recharge the battery when the aircraft descended. I grabbed the maintenance record. It was still the law that each aircraft must carry a printed copy of the maintenance records. Even in the digital age, old laws die hard. The fact that this aircraft had a maintenance record was a good sign. It meant that Eddie Rizzo, as rough as he looked, still obeyed the law and his plane had been cared for, at least according to the log. I flipped through the reports and noticed that the plane had a 90-kilowatt battery. This battery made up the bulk of the aircraft's weight at about 300 pounds. 
I had flown electrogliders before, but none with this much power. The Stingray had other interesting modifications, like a charge port on the roof. I'd heard of these before, but never suspected they were actually used. The port was designed for in-air supercharging. I stuck my head into the cockpit and hit the master switch, activating the displays. All the instruments were digital, but they represented the standard six-pack of any small aircraft. The top three instruments showed the airspeed, altitude, and attitude, while the bottom three showed the turn and bank, heading, and vertical speed. I looked at the airspeed indicator. The velocity to never exceed, or VNE, was 310 knots. This was fast, fast enough to keep up with a military helicopter. The green zone, or cruising speeds, ranged from 40 knots to 250 knots. As the crow flies, Las Vegas and San Francisco are 300 miles apart, so it would take just over an hour to get from one city to the other. I walked back into the office and let Eddie Rizzo know we had a deal. He didn't even ask to see my pilot's license. The next morning I headed back to Henderson Airfield. It was strange waking up alone, getting into a car and driving somewhere. It felt like a business trip or the first day of school when you have no idea what to expect, but instead of nervousness, there was dread. I worried at any moment I'd receive horrible news. I filed a flight plan at a kiosk in the flight club and waved at the dispatch lady who buzzed me onto the tarmac through a single door. It was sunrise when I opened the hangar. I didn't see Eddie Rizzo, which didn't surprise me. The guy came off as a night owl. I found the survey equipment, two aerodynamic wedges shaped like a ship's radar. I grabbed the devices and slid them into place. They fit under the wings like missiles on a fighter jet. Once attached to the aircraft, they booted up. A small display on each device registered auto sequence start, indicating they were ready to go. Eddie's request to have me survey California made me feel dirty, like I was invading someone's privacy. I even wondered if the SAR guys would take issue with me using the equipment. They probably wouldn't even ask. It wasn't any different than a prospector with a metal detector or a scuba diver looking for shipwrecks. Grabbing a tow bar, I dragged the aircraft out onto the tarmac. One wing rested on the ground, a rusty skid protecting the wingtip from the concrete. The other wing rose into the morning sky. After returning the tow bar to the hangar, I climbed into the cockpit. I closed the tinted bubble-style canopy and checked the controls. Rudder left, rudder right, I said to myself, stepping on the foot pedals and looking over my shoulder to see the twin rudders moving freely. I checked the ailerons, swinging the control stick to the left and right. Using my left hand, I extended the dive brakes, making sure they could be fully deployed and fully retracted. All the controls seemed in good shape. I hit the master, activating the displays and watched the dials move silently into place. Activating the turbofan sent a whirring noise through the cockpit. As the volume increased, I grabbed the headset from behind the seat and pulled it over my ears. The headset smelled like Eddie's office. I'd be used to the smell in a few minutes, so I ignored it. The stingray leveled itself as the motors pulled air over the wing roots. The frequency of the motors canceled each other out, leaving a smooth hum like riding a Cadillac on freshly laid concrete. I flipped on the radio and tuned in to the airport's frequency. Henderson Tower, this is EG Niner. Request clearance to taxi to runway 17 left, I said. EG Niner, clear to taxi Foxtrot for takeoff on runway 17 left. The aircraft coasted across the tarmac as I adjusted the pressure on the throttle. I brought it to a stop at the button, the line that separates the taxiway from the runway. Henderson Tower, EG Niner is ready for takeoff. EG Niner, clear for takeoff runway 17 left. At 500 feet, turn to heading 340 replied the tower. Copy, 340. I pushed in the throttle and felt the acceleration generated by the electric motors. The plane went from 0 to 60 in under 5 seconds and was airborne after 200 feet. The city of Las Vegas sank down below me and I admired the colorful lights that littered the strip. For a moment, just a moment, I forgot why I was here and marveled at the wonder of human flight. I thought of a poem written by RCAF pilot John Gillespie McGee Jr. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter's silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds, and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Wheeled and soared and swung, high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along, and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the wind-swept heights with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent, lifting mind I've trod, the high, untrespassed sanctity of space put out my hand and touched the face of God. The second-to-last line struck me today. The high, untrespassed sanctity of space. We had trespassed on the sanctity of space, a place previously reserved for exploration and wonder. 
We had brought a piece of space down to Earth with horrific consequences. John McGee died in his Spitfire days after penning that verse. I wondered if he knew that, in the end, there was no sanctity. With that thought, I banked my aircraft to heading 340, climbing high in the sunlit silence. The Stingray's hybrid electric engines cut out. They were no longer needed. With the turbine blades feathered, I glided silently all the way to Nellis. Chapter 5. Search and Rescue When I landed at Nellis, ground control directed me to the search and rescue hangar. The electroglider bumped along the old taxiways, and I could feel every crack in the pavement through my seat. To save weight, the plane didn't have a tricycle landing gear like a traditional aircraft. Instead, a single gear extended from below the cockpit while a small tailwheel hung off the rear. An airfoil behind the turbofan stabilized the aircraft, but it still felt like riding a unicycle. The SAR squadron wasn't hard to find with its insignia painted 40 feet high on the hangar door. Parked outside the hangar were 10 heavy lift helicopters. Three other vertical takeoff aircraft, all third generation Ospreys, sat nearby. There were also two civilian tail draggers parked off to the side, both Cessna bird dogs, scouting aircraft used as far back as the Vietnam War. I parked the Stingray in an electric aircraft only parking spot and climbed out. Opening a small hatch in the tarmac, I pulled down the electroglider's charge cord and plugged into the base's power supply. As I walked toward the hangar and the helicopters, I saw three people who looked to be in the middle of a briefing. One person excused himself and walked toward me. The man walked with military confidence, his jet black hair cut to military spec. It was the first time I had seen Avro without his helmet. He hadn't shaved that morning, which accented his square jawline. If it weren't for the flight suit, I'd swear I was looking at a professional soccer player. Johnny, glad you could make it. Glad to help. I was anxious, nervous, and scared, but knew I was where I needed to be. I'm still wondering how I'll be of any use. Let me dispel that confusion, Avro said, shaking my hand. There were two rescue squadrons on the West Coast, the 129th Rescue Wing at Moffett Field. I used to eat with those guys in the cafeteria at Ames. The other was stationed at Edwards. We lost both squadrons. Those women and men were the best of the best. I'm sorry, I said. Avro accepted my sympathies with a nod. So here's the plan. Each rescue helicopter is getting a civilian wingman. Your job will be to tag prospective targets for evacuation or termination. Termination? You heard me correct, Avro said. The helicopters are armed and will have drone support. This is a war zone, John, and attrition is part of the strategy. So you need us as decoys? We'll be adding an electronic countermeasures package to your aircraft. You'll be fine. I looked back at my plane, which from this angle looked very much like a stingray. I wondered how it would hold up under fire. It was definitely maneuverable enough, but I'd need to rely heavily on countermeasures if I was going to be dodging bullets. When do we start? I asked. Shouldn't we be at that briefing? That's not a briefing, Avro answered. Those pilots are waiting for their wingmen. But what about those civilian aircraft? Where are their pilots? I asked, glancing over at the bird dogs. The other pilots didn't show. We're having trouble finding pilots to fly into an area full of cartel loyalists who think the government just tried to bomb them into oblivion. Oh, I said. Come with me. Let's grab your SAR computer and countermeasures and get in the air. Metal shelves ran along the walls of the hangar. The shelves held devices of all sorts stacked in cubbies. Avro walked over to the wall, picking up a tablet and something that looked like a pipe bomb. That must be the countermeasure package, I thought. You got piss bottles? Avro asked. It's going to be a long day. Tomorrow we'll get you a catheter. I nodded. Yeah, I've got piss bottles. I had water bottles in the cockpit that would do. Avro tossed me a sharpie. Label them so you don't accidentally, well, you know. Thanks for the advice. I pocketed the sharpie. Avro nodded. All right, boss, let's get you set up. Back at the electroglider, Avro handed me the SAR flight computer. I took the device and walked towards the cockpit. The SAR computer had a flexible arm with a screw clip on its end. I secured the tablet to the airframe inside the cockpit. Avro headed to the tail. Using specialized quick ties, he fastened the countermeasures device to the empennage. This is a good setup you've got here, Avro said, running a hand along the wing. How so? I asked, feeling ashamed to have shown up with an electric aircraft. Like early electric car owners facing questions about range anxiety, I worried there would be a similar stigma around electric aircraft. Most light aircraft top out at 160 knots. You can go north of 200. Also, other aircraft have to refuel about every three hours. Technically, I need to quick charge every three, I said. Technically, said Avro, but we'll be flying across the mountains where you can expect plenty of updrafts. That's free gas for you. True, I said. 
And, Avro said, I can release a thousand volt mag line behind the chopper. I noticed that supercharger port you got on the roof. You do, huh? I said with a slight smile. I think you know something about electrogliders. I do, actually. I sold this one to Eddie. Avro and I took off from Nellis and headed west. We were quite the pair. Him in his super stallion, a beast of a machine, and me in my little stingray. Avro's helicopter would be heard for miles and shook the ground as it approached. My aircraft was barely audible. For a moment I felt unworthy, but as we climbed into the sky I realized the electroglider was much faster than the stallion. Any anxiety I had about being a drag on the operation drifted away. We climbed up and over the red rocks to the west of Vegas, getting our first view of the mountains that had protected it from the air blast. My engine cut out and switched to regeneration mode as the electroglider soared along the windward side of a mountain range like a surfer on a wave. We reached cruising altitude and completed our radio checks. To our left and right, snow-capped mountains rose beyond my aircraft's operating ceiling. Take the lead, Johnny, Avro said over the radio. His voice came through my headset with perfect clarity. Head north through Death Valley, then cut west at Yosemite. Rendezvous north of Sacramento. Let me know if you run into any trouble. Roger that. See you on the other side. I could see Avro in his cockpit on my starboard, and I gave him a quick salute. He saluted back, and I wondered how he saw me through the tinted glass. I pushed my throttle forward and accelerated ahead of the lumbering chopper. I swooped down over the remains of Yosemite Valley. Oh my God, I thought, looking at the devastation. Half Dome had broken off, embedding itself in the valley floor, while El Capitan had split in half like a V. A dozen multicolored tents near Glacier Point caught my attention. There was movement between the tents. I banked the aircraft around for a closer look. Six brown bears milled about between the campsites. Three of the bears had their heads in coolers. By the look of it, the survivors had already been rescued, so I continued on. I flew down from the mountains and into the foothills. The area reminded me of Pompeii, a city frozen in time. Cars were burnt to a crisp and several dead bodies lay nearby. I gagged but held it in. The landscape improved as I flew north. I let the throttle idle, the aircraft's long wings allowing me to cruise at under 40 knots. Besides the earthquake damage to the roads and buildings, the natural landscape looked unaffected. Birds circled in the breeze as if it were just another beautiful day. As I cruised low over a highway, I noticed flecks of light zipping out from the corner of my eye. Moments later, I heard the crack, crack, crack of the muzzle blast, the noise delayed by the speed of sound. I'm being shot at, I realized. I watched two men taking cover behind a beat-up Ford pickup. The truck's red paint had faded after years in the California sun. I hit the transmit button on my radio. Taking small arms fire here, I said, trying my best to sound calm. Don't worry about it, Avro replied. Don't worry about it, I yelled back into the radio. Yeah, don't worry about it, I'll be there in ten minutes, over. I glanced back at my attackers and realized that they were covering their eyes. I looked closer. They appeared to be painted in a blinding green light. The SAR computer displayed a message. Arms suppression activated. Oh, God, I said. Apparently, the countermeasures that Avro installed on my aircraft included suppression lasers. When the sensors detected small arms fire directed at the aircraft, the lasers locked onto the assailants, temporarily blinding them. Damn it, Avro, you could have told me I'd be blinding people, I yelled. Wait for it, Avro said. Wait for what? I asked in a panic. Are you still watching the bogies? Avro asked. Yeah, why? I asked, banking the aircraft to maintain visual contact. Wait for it, Avro said. I detected a smile in his voice. Something caught my eye and two streaks of light whizzed down from the sky towards the attackers. I watched as the streaks sliced the men in half from head to groin, their bodies exploding outward, leaving two red stains on the golden California grass. What the hell was that? I yelled into the radio. Predator drone, guided bullets, Avro said. The lasers on your aircraft guide the bullets to their target. That was brutal, I said. This operation has zero tolerance for civilian casualties. Absolutely zero. This method also helps reduce the enemy's reliance on human shields. What if they shine a laser back at me? I asked. Your aircraft's canopy reflects laser light. Just get out of there, would ya? Avro instructed. I pushed the throttle to full and climbed past 1,000 feet and continued my sweep of the area. Avro, John here. I radioed on our shared frequency. I see people waving their arms at me. Looks like about 20 people. Hang tight, Johnny, Avro radioed back. There's a wide scan option on your SAR display. Check them for weapons and explosives. I don't want any bombs on my chopper. I tapped the display and a live video feed of the area appeared. The video divided into grids. Select target zone, I said to the computer. 
On the display, I watched the people waving their arms and selected the zone containing the people. Fly a circuit around the target area, the computer instructed me in a calm tone. I cut the throttle and extended the dive brakes, descending in an arcing path. Scanning, 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 the computer announced. No arms detected. They're clean, I announced to Avro. All right, coming in for extraction. I watched as the giant helicopter raced in from the south, sounding like a thousand lawnmowers. Avro flew past the survivors, pulled back on the cyclic and reduced the throttle, effectively hitting the brakes. The chopper pitched up and descended. Avro chose a level stretch of road to make his landing. As the super stallion approached the pavement, a donut-shaped cloud of brown dust rose into the air around it. The helicopter's rear hatch opened. People ran towards the helicopter, some protecting their heads and others covering their ears. Once they were aboard, Avro closed the hatch and lifted back up into the air. Where now? I asked. Beale Air Force Base, Avro replied. Fifteen miles north of here. The National Guard is holding the base, but it's a hot zone. We'll drop the civilians off and refuel. If you see anyone who needs rescuing along the way, we'll pick them up. I've got a few empty seats here. Roger, see you at Beale, I said, selecting Beale Air Force Base on my GPS. We switched our radios from a private frequency to the general search and rescue channel and Avro radioed the base, letting them know we were coming. Beale Air Force Base hustled and bustled with activity despite the cracks in the runway, some large enough to drop a tank into. The hangars had significant earthquake damage and the wooden barracks were completely flattened. Even the control tower was a pile of bricks. On the plus side, there were third-generation Ospreys ready to airlift the civilians out of California and medical tents set up in a staging area. I noticed eight helipads mapped out in bright orange spray paint, each a 30-foot painted square with an H in the middle. For a moment, I was seriously concerned that there would be nowhere for me to land. Fortunately, I only needed a few hundred feet of runway. I did a low pass over the tarmac and found a place with enough undamaged concrete. I lined up for my approach, deploying my spoilers and dive brakes. I pulled back on the throttle, setting turbofan regeneration to full. This slowed the aircraft to 35 knots. Within moments, I was on the ground. When I came to a complete stop, a soldier in an orange vest marshaled me toward a parking spot. The airbase had emergency generators on site. I retrieved the power cord from the plane and within minutes had a full charge. Avro landed nearby and was out of his helicopter in seconds. He began helping the evacuees to a waiting Osprey. The Osprey's twin rotors were already spooling up as the people transferred from one aircraft to another. After the Osprey departed, Avro and I met on the tarmac. How you doing, boss? Ready to do it all over again? He asked. I nodded. Great. He had to yell to be heard over the sounds of the nearby generators. I've asked the team to throw some sandwiches and coffee into our cockpits. We'll stay in this area tonight and head back to Vegas tomorrow. After this, you'll want to keep a small suitcase with you. We'll be spending quite a few nights in the field. I nodded again, looking to my left as a corporal dropped off the food. Rock and roll, Avro said. He held up his hand for a fist pump. I returned the gesture and walked back to my aircraft. We rescued over 200 people that day, turning in shortly after midnight. We slept in a military green GP tent along with other members of the SAR squadron. The next morning we sat impatiently in the tent while a tech repaired Avro's stallion. It had taken a hit from a single guided bullet. Avro reached for a bottle of water. It crinkled as he squeezed the container, shooting the last drops of liquid into his mouth. Do you think we'll be assigned to the North Bay? I asked. Avro knew what I was asking. I wanted to search the area where I had lost track of my family. Hey, Lieutenant! He yelled to a young pilot who was still in bed. You're assigned to San Fran, right? The pilot slid into a seated position, dangling his legs over the bed and letting the blankets rest on his lap. Yeah, place is messed up. A duffel bag sat at the end of his bunk. A name tag that read Jameson was sewn into the green canvas. Who's got that sector now? Captain Gimpley's got it, Jameson replied. Gimpley, damn it. Avro shook his head at the floor. He looked up, his eyes widening, and the corners of his mouth curved up, giving him a mischievous look. Who's Gimpley? I whispered. You sound like you don't get along with the guy. Gimpley's not a guy, Avro said. She's my ex-wife. I didn't know what to say, so I just stared at the green wall of the tent. The tent had six windows made of transparent plastic, which didn't provide much visibility, but let in the morning light. I looked over at Avro. He was concentrating. Any chance we can trade sectors? I asked. Yeah, we can ask. Follow me. It'll be fun. Avro stood up, wrapping a small white towel around his boxer shorts. I pulled on my jeans, which made me look out of place, and chased after him. Avro marched into the only hangar that was still standing. He ducked under an Osprey's propeller and walked along a row of offices on the far side of the hangar. 
Names and ranks were written in Sharpie on each door. He checked the names until he found the one he was looking for. I stood back, not knowing what to expect. Avro knocked, and a woman in full military dress opened the door. When she saw Avro, a look of pure, unadulterated rage crossed her face. And out of her mouth shot the longest stream of obscenities I'd ever heard, ending with, You goddamn cheating son of a whore! The woman's black hair was tied in a bun, and her pale round face reddened as she swore. Avro held up his arm as she tried to slap him. Avro was over a foot taller than the stout woman, and most of the blows impacted on his forearm, but some struck his bare torso. I told you not to ever, 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 ever come see me again. Avro backed away to the middle of the hangar floor. A mechanic working under a nearby helicopter slid from under his aircraft on a creeper and just stared. Captain Gimpley gave Avro one final blow to the ribs, stormed back into the office, and slammed the door. Avro stood in his towel, and even with his tan-colored skin, I could see the bruises. That's your ex-wife? I said, my plans for switching search zones fading fast. Ah, uh, yeah, sort of, I guess. It's a long story. No, it's a very short story, actually. I walked with Avro back to the tent. I looked towards Avro's helicopter in the distance. The tech was finishing up a weld on the patch. Well, I prompted. Okay, Johnny, but you keep this a secret, okay? Avro stopped walking, facing me. You got it, I said. We continued walking, picking up two individual meal packs, IMPs, on the way back to the tent. Gimpley was my senior officer, but in SAR we try not to take rank too seriously. We were stationed in Vegas and hit the strip four times a week, at least. Gimpley and I became a killer blackjack team. You counted cards? You keep that a secret, too. Avro pointed at my chest. I nodded, and he continued. Anyway, it was her birthday, and everyone bought her shots. We ended up on the dance floor, and before we knew it, everyone else had gone home, and it was just her and me. Boy, were we wasted. We left the club and stumbled past a little chapel off the strip, found a rabbi dressed as Elvis and got married. I awoke the next morning in the Altucher suite, Vegas's most expensive Airbnb. I had a searing headache and Jane Gimpley was gone. Avro took a large bite of blueberry muffin before continuing. I got texts all day, like, what do you want for dinner, honey, and I'll be home soon, my love, which I thought was hilarious, so I played along. She was my senior, so we couldn't reveal what we'd done. I figured it would stay a secret, you know, forever. What happens in Vegas, right? Right, I repeated. That night, the guys went out on the town again. Captain Gimpley was still out on a mission. I had a few too many again. Hit the dance floor again. I played wingman for one of my fellow pilots. Before we knew it, we were making out with two beautiful brunettes. Well, his was beautiful anyway. I laughed. Gimpley returned from her mission and came looking for me. When she didn't find me in the barracks, she accessed my military RFID chip. Avro held up his left wrist, pointing to a scar. To track me down. The woman is batshit crazy. She found me, hauled me onto the street, and gave me this scar. Avro pointed to his temple. And this scar, he said, pointing to his jaw. You didn't hit back, did you? Hell no, Johnny. I just stood there and took it. The next day, there were two sets of documents hidden in my bedsheets. The first informed me that I'd been transferred to another CO. Avro took another bite of his muffin. What was the other document? I asked. Avro snorted and then answered, Divorce papers. Chapter 6. Recruited It had been a year since impact. My family was still missing, and the cartel continued its guerrilla war against the U.S. government. The SAR squadron had lost eight pilots out of the 30 back in the beginning. I had originally planned to return to NASA once I found my family. But within a month of the disaster, Congress dissolved NASA after an independent panel determined that due diligence could have prevented the whole thing. After losing a class-action lawsuit, there was no money left to continue and I was left with a toxic organization on my resume. Eddie Rizzo made a steady profit off the data I provided. He was one of many people looking to cash in on unclaimed California resources. To me, Eddie was nothing more than a desperate scavenger. When I saw him, which wasn't often, he tried to tell me where to fly, so I avoided him as best I could. After the impact, I spent a month living in a rundown Super 8 motel. After that, I rented a furnished studio apartment near the base. I also bought a motorcycle so I could get to my aircraft before dawn each morning, which beat having to wait for an auto car to pick me up. On the first anniversary of the impact, I showed up at Nellis at the usual time. Avro met me in the alley between two hangars where I parked my bike. Before I shut off the motorcycle, I knew something had changed. Hey, Johnny, Avro said. Hey, I said, stepping on the kickstand and dismounting the cycle. The enclosed space between the hangars suddenly felt claustrophobic. I just got word from my CO. They're calling off the search, Avro said. We're being redeployed. Calling off the search? What about my family? 
I could feel my face reddening and my stomach tightening as my body entered a state of fight or flight. I felt the anger surge through me and I turned and punched the seat of the bike. I stood leaning over the motorcycle with my back to Avro. John, we haven't rescued anyone in weeks, Avro said. We've had a dozen teams in the air every day, putting their lives on the line. There's no one left. I turned around, yelling now. So, what, now we're just supposed to go home? Go home to what? No one's going home. We've been redeployed, Avro said. I've been redeployed, he corrected himself. What do you mean, you've been redeployed? Redeployed to where? I said. San Diego. I'll be stationed on the Enterprise. They're sending in more ground troops to fight the cartel, and we're to provide support. The civilian rescue mission is officially over. Damn it, I swore. I had no idea what to do next, not only in that moment, but with my life. You're a fine pilot, Johnny, and a good wingman, Avro said. Don't do anything stupid. Doing something stupid was exactly what I needed to do. I'm going out there, I said, and stormed off toward the hangar. Avro followed. Don't do it, John, he said, grabbing my shoulder. I shook him off. Don't go out there alone, not without drone support. The hangar door was open. I walked in, snatching a tow bar off the wall and connecting it to my plane. Avro didn't stop me. He just stood there as I dragged the stingray onto the tarmac. You need to get out of Vegas and start over. Go back to D.C. if you have to. I chucked the tow bar into the hangar. It clattered against the floor and slid into the side wall. I threw open the canopy and hopped in, activating the twin turbines as soon as my ass hit the chair. Avro backed away as the props sucked the air. Goodbye, Avro, I yelled over the sound of the fans. It's been a pleasure. I slammed the canopy shut, leaving Avro alone. Hitting the throttle and not bothering to taxi to a runway, I took to the sky. The air traffic controllers would write me up for that stunt, but I didn't give a damn. To hell with Nellis. With the throttle at full, I cruised toward San Francisco at full speed. I developed a habit of listening to music while over the mountains, becoming addicted to an old band Marie had turned me on to, Angels and Airwaves. I'd listen to the same songs over and over. The songs made me angry, but in a good way. I was angry at the hate I felt, and one particular song seemed to justify that, so I turned it on. But those words from your mouth, they are scary, and the hate that you have, that you carry, it will grow, it will grow till we're buried, and there will be nothing left except sadness, and a scar without words, without anything, because we've done this before, this is madness. This was madness, what I was doing. I'd been risking my life every day, and for what? My life was a purposeless repetition. This was my last flight. After today, my search was over and I'd never return to California again. I reached San Francisco and flew north over the remains of the Bay Bridge. The bridge's piers remained, but the roadway had fallen into the bay. Treasure Island was underwater, only a few foundations rising up from the waves. On my right, two red towers were all that was left of the Golden Gate Bridge. I flew low over the water between the towns of Sausalito and Tiburon then around Mount Tamalpais and Point Reyes Station. I was looking for a camp or some civilian holdout we might have missed. Maybe there were still people here. Maybe they were hiding. Regrets poured through my head. Did we try hard enough to negotiate with the cartel? Should we have met their demands? They had demanded the execution of everyone involved with the impact. No, we did the best we could and Avro was right. The area wasn't just cleared of civilians. It was cleared of everyone. I was getting low on power, so I flew along the shoreline catching the updraft as the sea breeze blew inland. The electroglider was light, and the mildest winds would push it higher in the sky. But I didn't need altitude, just power, so I tilted downward into the airstream and let moist air flow up through the turbines, recharging the batteries. I was soaring along the ridge back near Point Reyes when I was hit. Whack! I looked out to see a four-inch hole in the underside of the wing, halfway between the turbines and the wingtip. Shards of carbon fiber flew up into the sky. Bam! Another hit somewhere behind me. I pulled back on the stick and let the updraft carry me high into the sky. I hit the throttle, rocketing the stingray to 300 knots. Streaks of light whizzed past. Countermeasure failure, said the computer in her usual pleasant tone. Oh boy. This wasn't the first time it had happened. The cartel was getting increasingly advanced. Like our drones, they had bullets that curved to hit their targets. Avro had been right. I shouldn't have come alone. I hit the rudder and yawed the aircraft 30 degrees to port, skidding around like a fish turning upstream. I looked over my shoulder, trying to catch a glance at whoever was shooting at me. Two men were huddled in a bunker. They must have been guarding the shore, using the bunkers built during World War II. They took another shot, and a bullet ripped through the cockpit, missing my leg by a hair's width. 
The bullet passed up through the floor and out through the canopy, making a coin-sized hole in the glass. For a moment I panicked, continuing to fly higher and higher at full power. When the shock of the attack wore off, I was at 20,000 feet and back over San Francisco. The computer inundated me with alerts. Battery low. Recharge. Recharge. She said. Oxygen required. Oxygen required. Battery low. Battery low. I addressed the oxygen alarm first. At this altitude, a person risked passing out. Reaching down, I unlatched a small oxygen tank from its holster and put the mask on. I tested the aircraft's controls. They all worked. The bullets had missed the control lines and the battery. The holes in the cockpit made whistling noises as wind rushed past the gaps. I had a roll of duct tape under my seat and I placed a single strip of tape over each hole. On a good day, an electro glider with a dead battery has a glide ratio of 30 to 1. The aircraft's computer calculated my current range. At 20,000 feet, I could glide 120 miles. This did not, however, take into account the hole in my wing. I suppose I could have radioed for help, little good that would do, but pride kept my finger from the transmitter. I was angry, but not angry enough to let myself die. Work the problem, I said, searching my GPS for a safe hill crest that could provide enough updraft for battery regeneration. I considered Mount Tamalpais first, but that was only a few miles away. I needed to get further away from my attackers. I considered Mount Diablo and the Altamont Pass to the east. Windmills covered these hills for a reason. I have a windmill on each wing, I thought, but I'd just be a target for cartel in that area. I continued to study the map. Every hillside within 200 miles was under cartel control. There was nowhere to hide and nowhere with enough updraft to recharge the batteries. If Avro were here, he'd just drop a line from the chopper and let me supercharge off the stallion's alternator. I looked at the family photo I had taped to the canopy. You're still alive, I told myself, concentrating on my son's eyes. I realized there was a place that was not on the map, a place that had one hell of a hillside and would create the perfect updraft. The impact crater. I typed Fresno into the GPS. The city, or what remained of the city, was 150 miles away. According to the computer, I'd hit the ground 30 miles shy of the ruined city. But the impact crater was 10 miles north of Fresno. That left a gap of 20 miles. The crater itself had to be huge, so I took off another 5 miles. That was close enough. I turned the aircraft southeast and began my glide towards Fresno. After 50 miles, I realized that there was one thing I hadn't considered, the sea breeze. Warm air in the valley rises during the day and pulls cool air in from the Pacific. This is why San Francisco is cool during the summer. It would be close, but the sea breeze would give me the range to make it to the crater. No one went near the impact zone, not even the cartel. It was an area of total devastation. In every direction, boulders covered the scorched earth. Even if I wanted to land, I couldn't without hitting the rocks. Near the crater, the earth was different shades of gray and black. For the last few miles, I could feel the thermals under my wings. Columns of rising air like smoke from a campfire buffeted the aircraft like a Land Rover rumbling over uneven terrain. Without engine power, I wasn't really flying. I was soaring. Soaring is what birds do when they cruise around without flapping their wings. With the turbines feathered and most of the electronics turned off to save energy, it was quiet in the cockpit. The sound of the wind rushing around the airframe was white noise after spending so many hours in the sky. I had only a thousand feet of altitude when I reached the rim. I approached from the west, estimating my ground speed by banking perpendicular to the wind and watching my sideways movement over the ground. I estimated the wind speed at 20 knots. Imagine the crater as a toilet flushed upside down. Ground-level winds from the west poured down over the rim following the curve of the crater until spiraling up into the sky. My goal was to get swept up into the sweet spot, the drain of my imaginary toilet. I brought the aircraft over the rim. It felt as though I was being flushed as the winds hurled my aircraft toward the crater floor. I had to make it to the other side, where the winds climbed the crater walls on the eastern edge. When I reached the floor, I was moving at over 200 knots. When an aircraft flies low over the ground, drag is reduced substantially. Air rushing over the wingtips connects with the ground, preventing vortices that otherwise tug on the aircraft. I used this phenomenon to coast to the eastern edge of the crater. Then I found it. I found the updraft of a glider pilot's dreams. Whoosh! The updraft kicked me in the butt, sucking the aircraft skyward in a vacuum of current. In seconds, I leapt out of the crater thrown higher and higher by the vertical airflow. The updraft exceeded 50 knots. I steered into the draft and unfeathered the turbines, letting the wind press against the fans. I watched as they began spinning, 
slowly at first, then faster and faster until they disappeared completely into a semi-transparent blur. I turned to my displays, watching the battery levels. For two minutes, the levels remained unchanged. Come on, come on, I said to myself. I got the first bar when the battery's charge reached 1%. The next hour was tedious, holding my position within the updraft. On a good day, I'd need a 60% charge to make it back to Vegas. But with multiple holes in my aircraft, I figured I had better get a full charge. After 90 minutes floating above the crater, I'd completely charged the battery. I hit the throttle, switching from regen mode to full power, and headed east. I landed at Henderson Field, thinking I could patch the aircraft in Eddie's hangar without him finding out. That didn't happen. He was waiting for me when I landed. You son of a bitch! What the hell did you do to my aircraft? He yelled as I taxied to the hangar. Eddie's face was red and seething with rage. His fat jiggled as he cursed. I thought he was going to punch me. I was shot, damn it. Eddie didn't touch me. Shoot yourself, he said, following me to the hangar. You damaged my aircraft, didn't get any surveys, and you haven't paid me in weeks. Listen, I said, stopping and turning to face him. I stood six inches taller than him, and as pissed as I was, I felt seven feet tall. I flew over the crater today. I flew all over the areas I couldn't when I was with Sar. I looked over at Eddie's survey equipment, still hanging from the wings. Eddie and I just stared at each other for a moment. I was the first to break the silence. We're even. Get the hell out of here, he muttered. I left the airfield and waved down a car. After retrieving my bike from the airbase, I slumped into my apartment and grabbed a beer, convinced I would drink myself unconscious and pass out for a day. Tomorrow, I'd ride east and leave it all behind. A message flashed on my holovision. I hadn't had a personal message in months. What the hell? I thought. Holographic messages were personal and no one I knew anymore was that personal. I played the message. It began with a video of the electroglider taking off. The video had been shot from the end of a runway at Nellis. It showed me on my bike, taken from a security camera. This must be some sort of sick joke, I thought. The Red Planet Mining Corporation logo flashed in front of me, and a corporate jingle rang out through my speakers. I wanted to think someone was screwing with me, but pulling footage from a security camera on a military base argued against that. Hello, John, said the message. A man appeared in front of me. I stood up with my beer in hand to see that he was about my height. The holovision gave the impression that a person was standing right in front of you, and the effect was convincing. As you can tell, we've been watching you, he said. No kidding. Red Planet is recruiting and we need pilot engineers. Because of our mission to cut costs, we need folks willing to relocate. People who have no immediate family, so they can concentrate on their work, without distractions. That makes impact survivors like you perfect candidates. Convince me. Work for us for 15 years. On top of your salary, you'll be given a full retirement package, including the home of your choice in one of the Red Planet Executive Resort communities. Images of the resorts flashed up on the screen, as well as a description of the amenities. Indoor ski hills, beaches, and so on. Just board the next transport to Mars and everything will be taken care of. You won't even need a ticket. The video paused, leaving an awkward silence. In a negotiation, silence is a winning tactic. It causes the other person to talk, filling the dead air. I looked at the beer in my hand, wondering if there was beer on Mars. Well, I said to the holovision, the image had paused. I took the last sip of my beer and tossed the can across the room into the recycle sorter. For a moment, I stood there wondering what would happen if I jumped into it, wondering how it would sort me. Was I garbage, or could I be recycled into something new? Sure, Red Planet mined the minerals that had crashed into Northern California, but it wasn't their fault the CTS Bradbury crashed. It wasn't their idea to build Destiny Colony just to boost the economy, giving engineers like me something to do. Screw it. I'll do it, I said just above a whisper. Thanks, and we'll see you on Mars. Your contract will arrive momentarily. My phone dinged.